All right, and we are live. Welcome, welcome back, guys, to another episode of the Peak Performance Project. I'm super excited to welcome on the show Basi Prokofiev. How's hey, it going? It's perfect. You said it I right. Got, I, I got <laughs> it. I got it. I'm, I'm actually, I'm excited about that. I always joke around. I'm, I'm terrible at pronouncing last names sometimes, so I always wanna, wanna make sure that, that I get it right. So, Basi, welcome to the show. I'm super excited to have you on. Um, how's your day going? It's good, good. Just staying busy with the workouts. Off season is in full mode, even though we're slowly getting back to normal. But still, yeah, four or five workouts a day. Just that's the norm. Gotcha, you, gotcha. You. And then, as we're getting started, for anyone who might not know who you are yet, just give us an idea of your background, and what you do, and how how you got into what you're doing currently. Okay, so you already said my name, and you can see it on the screen too. Uh, I'm from Russia. I'm 29. Uh, I played a little bit, a little bit in college in States, and then I played a bit professionally in Belarus, Mexico, and Ecuador. And after that, I started to work with the players individually. Uh, I did both basketball and sports performance training. In college, my major was kinesiology and exercise science. Gotcha. And so that's, it has been, I want to say, four years when I've been working with the players full time when mm -hmm. I stopped playing. But the funny thing was I started working with the ones while I was still playing. And so it ended up, I first had just the kids, the ones who would be from my, from my native town. And I just wanted to kind of like mentor them and take yeah. them under my wing. And it slowly ended up to where I'm thinking, okay, now I guess I'll be, I'll be coaching players. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then um, at what point you said this had like the transition to what kind of wanted to be a trainer and stuff like that happened, like while you were still playing? Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. When I was playing in Mexico, um, okay. my goal was at least every week to do maybe a clinic for kids or visit to a local high school and just train kids because I was in a rural area in the south of Mexico and there were gotcha. not only I'm not even talking about professional basketball teams. There were not that many foreigners yeah. who played basketball. And I was thinking, okay, what if what if I'm that kid who wants kind of wants to play basketball but doesn't know, and then suddenly one day he gets uh, he meets a foreigner who is from yeah. the other part of the world who's been playing yeah. professionally and whose number one love is playing basketball, and that's how uh, that's how he earns his living. What if I mm -hmm. could be that inspiration for a younger kid? And so we started just with with those small visits to schools when I would show them the drills and all that. Then ended up, uh, I did some camps in Russia and then slowly just progressed like, snow, I want to say like snowball effect where you, yeah. work, you work with kids, then you get uh, one professional player that wants to try and work with you. Uh, then he likes the quality and he just goes to another ones. And then after that, I want to say uh, since 2012, since 21, 22, I haven't been really living in Russia full time until mm -hmm. this year. And so it was always three years in States, then two years, Belarus, Mexico, Ecuador, and then two and a half years in China. So I have, have been traveling all over the world and all that yeah. thanks to multiple. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Definitely. Uh, you never know where basketball will take you. I mean, for me, it was going from LA to Minnesota. So that, that was a transition. <laughs> in and of itself. Nothing, nothing crazy, like going, going to China or like other parts of the world or something like that. But definitely cool to see where basketball can take you. And, and looking at your, your content on Instagram, listening to some other podcasts that you were on, I, I think it's really interesting your approach to skills training and training in general, because you're kind of like a hybrid of both, like a skills trainer and a performance trainer, whereas a lot of people will kind of pick one and specialize in it. Um, like, be like, I'm just a skills trainer, I'm just a strength coach or performance trainer. What do you think led to you kind of taking more of that hybrid approach and, and really trying to um, master both uh, sides mm -hmm. of that? So how, how I built the foundation was when I was getting ready to go and play college in States. Uh, before college, I was studying university in Russia. Uh, and so I understood that my goal was to play professionally. And in order in order to yeah. do that at 22, 23, 24, the only way I have is to go to States and play in college. And mm -hmm. I understood that basketball-wise, skill-wise, I was below average if we compare 
somebody on NCAA Division One level, or even if we take NCAA Division Two level. And I was yeah. thinking, okay, I don't have enough coaching resources, enough basketball coaching resources in Russia, or people who uh, would help me develop as a basketball player. But there's still plenty of books, studies on strength training, mm -hmm. and so I can try at least and master something by myself and then le at least understand how uh, I can prepare myself physically just so when I get to States, it's not that I'm not very Got good you. at basketball and I'm not very good yeah. physically. It's at least yeah. something. Got at it. Least, at least coaches can see and say, okay, okay, he's pretty – he needs to work on basketball skills, but if we talk about his physical abilities, he's, he's above average. And so mm -hmm. that's what led me to – uh, start reading and just diving in more uh, if we talk about sports performance training. Uh, I want to say that's one. And then it's just, it goes uh, through the people that mentored me. The The main one at the point when I was, uh, when I was in college and all the way to when I started playing professionally was Mike Atkinson. He's the head strength coach for Westchester Knicks. And before he usually did both, also basketball and strength training. Mm -hmm. While now he still he still does some sort of basketball training sometimes with the players, but it's, uh, to me it's more uh, concentrated on like sports performance part. And yeah. so me having him as example and following him and ask messaging him, just annoying him, asking questions. Uh, he was that yeah. person who kind of gave me an idea of, okay, if I want first, if as a player, if I want to be a good player, I want to pay attention to my skill part as well as physical part. So this is how I came that, okay, I got to develop them both. Uh, and actually at that time when I was in college, I didn't think much about uh, mental training. Mm -hmm. That's, yep. I think that was one part that I was missing when I was in college and later when I started playing professionally in Belarus uh, because I was strong physically. I understood that I'm at least already average uh, on a basketball court or above average if we talk about, uh, let's say, Belarus League. But mm -hmm. part of the, that was missing, that was the mental part. And so even now when I'm working with the younger players, I try to cover not only basketball and sports performance training, but I also talk a little bit, a little bit about the mental parts. I'm not saying I'm a um, mental coach or something like that, but it's just I'm trying to use the tricks that helped me through my career uh, and just advise to players just to see what fits for them and how it can be helpful for them. So that's to answer your question. But. Uh, if we talk about both basketball and sports performance training, uh, another mentor of mine, Tim DeFrancesco, uh, the yeah. former head strength coach for Lakers, uh, yeah. he told me uh, one great one great idea that I'll never forget. And it was, I want to say three years ago, he's like, okay, Basi, so what are you doing? And I'm saying, Tim, I'm doing basketball and sports performance training. He's like, okay, where you want to work? Okay, do you think you're able to do both there? when we talking about the highest level i'm like uh probably no probably it's going to be only one and he's like okay if we're talking about nba level uh nobody will be in nobody will be hiring a person who's great at both because it's, it's really hard to be great at both uh mm -hmm. there's always going to be a part where a coach or even a player will be average and above average and so he told me just uh, take a pause, take 24 hours, and just let me know what you think is number one thing for your basketball or sports performance training. And so three years ago, I came uh, I came up with that, that basketball is number one thing. Because if we take sports performance training out of what I do, I'll be able to live with it. But if we take basketball out and I'll be doing strength training and with different types of athletes, I won't be able to do that. So... Uh, this is, if we go uh, and talk about basketball and sports performance and what I do, I want to say that now I'm more focused on basketball development. While if I get, if I get an inquiry from a player that, okay, I want to work on strength training as well, this is when I'll be doing both. 
but if there's somebody who's doing strength training uh, with a particular player, yeah. and he only wants me to do the basketball part, I'll just stay in my lane and I'll just go with basketball. And it's just now there's a great example where now I'm working with, with a couple of EuroLeague players in Moscow, and I'm the only coach working with them. And so they want me to cover both basketball and strength training. Tomorrow I'm flying to St. Petersburg for two weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be working with another group of pros. Uh, some of them already have a strength coach they're working with. So there's no point for me to be picky or to kind of like to be envy and say, no, you, you have to do both basketball and strength training with me. It's just there's no, no space for ego in coaching. Oh, yeah. And so at that point, when I'll be going there, for the ones who have a person they work on sports performance with, I'll just step back and I'll just do basketball part. If there will be players who want to do both, I'll do both with them. Got you. And then uh, also on that, uh, on a very similar note, like when it look, when it comes to your like basketball turn the basketball side of things, do you feel like the sports performance side of things has influenced the way you approach basketball training and like skills training? Yep. yep, for sure, for sure. And to me, that was that was important that when I was in college, I was studying kinesiology and exercise science yeah. just so I could understand biomechanics better because that's how I don't want to sound very smart because at the end of, at the, end of the day, basketball is a very simple game. Yeah. Uh, but I'm trying to look at basketball movements just from biomechanics standpoint. That would be easier for me to understand uh, why a player gets tired in the fourth quarter or why he or she is missing shots in the fourth quarter or why why there's a problem when somebody's uh, struggling finishing in the pain just just these details gotcha and then on the subject of, on the subject of finishing I know that's something we said we were gonna kind of mm -hmm. dive into in this episode that's something I think that will be really beneficial for everyone watching this because um, I haven't seen a lot, a ton of like really in-depth resources on it. So I, I'm excited to dive into it. So on, on that note, um, what would you say is your kind of general approach to developing someone into being a great finisher in the paint? And then we can dive into some, to some more specifics in a few minutes, but what would you say is like your kind of general approach to building someone into it? The, the basic uh, one will be finishing off any foot with any hand. That's the basic one. If, and if I have a player who comes to me for five days or four days, that's that's what I'm going to be talking about. If I have a player who comes to me at least for 10 days or two weeks, I'll be diving deeper into it. And we'll be talking about any foot, any hand uh, off any type of footwork, first step, second step, your step, cross step, cross step, whatever it can be off different spots on the glass and just different angles. Got you, got you. So in terms of like implementing different types of finishes, um, mm -hmm. how do you go about kind of adding adding a certain type of finish into someone's arsenal to, from the point of not knowing how to do it to now being able to rely on it in game kind of subconsciously mm -hmm. without having to think about, oh, okay, now I'm gonna do a right foot, right hand finish. Now I'm gonna do a Euro step. How do you kind of get um, people from that point of having to think about it and not really being able to do it to being able to accomplish that in game without really even having to think about it and just making those reads. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about layering the drills, I usually start with the basic one where a player has only one option and he only focusing on mechanics, on technical, on technical part, how many mm -hmm. steps he needs to take, where he needs to hit the glass, how he needs to spin the ball, all, all these details, that would be number one. Number two, we would add speed to it. Number three, it would be he would have two different options, and he would choose it based on uh, based on what he sees. I can show just like one, two, so all the visual reads. Yeah, uh, I want to say the next one will be number five or something. Number five would be um, oh, sorry, number four. Will, yeah, number four will be audio reads. So whatever yeah. I say, one or two, player will have to react to it and choosing between those two options. And number five will be the visual reads. So he'll have to react to either what I'm showing or the colors. We can put just the phone with the app that shows different colors somewhere where the help side defender can be just so uh, it will help a player to make a decision on what type of finish he'll, he'll be using. 
And then number six, uh, it will be just starting to use it in one-on-one -on -one games. Number seven, just practice, practicing and limiting it during the practice, team practice, five-on-five -on -five games, three-on-three -three games, one-on-one -on -one games. And number mm -hmm. eight, just using it in the game. So if we go a little bit deeper into it, uh, when I told about the when I told you about the audible reads and the visual reads, yeah, uh, I'm sure you know that there are plenty of studies that show whenever uh, the brains uh, the brain sends signals slower to muscles when they react to visual to something visual, and gotcha. so you can even try it with the, with the players where you either show them the number or say go one two and just different type of stuff. And usually whenever they can hear, they will react faster rather than whatever they see and they need to make a decision. And so this is to me a little bit more game-like. So that, that would be one. And then the other thing I wanted to cover, cover a little bit more will be um, when talking about adding something to Arsenal, to in-game Arsenal, uh, I want to limit the player in practice. For example, if you're if you're right hand dominant, you don't drive left, or even if you drive left, you finish with the right. Yeah. Your limitation will be in a, all shots in the paint have to be either a jump shot of your right hand if you're a right handed uh, player, or left hand layups. So anytime you're driving in the paint, you have to finish with the left hand, and it just what it makes you, it makes you feel uh, less comfortable because that's mm -hmm. not how your body and that's not what your brain is used to. But at the same time, you can see how some players, they start to slow down, take extra kind of like step. It looks, it looks a little bit shaky, but they may, they making the move. They're not even thinking about, but it looks so natural. And so this is one thing that I really love adding because you can see how even when we do simple three-man weave, and I'm sure plenty of people do that when when they're in college or even in high school. So my idea is imagine for all the right-handed players, no matter where they attack in three-man weave, imagine all the pain takes w w would have to be with the left hand. Then for some of the guys, it would be, oh, man, left hand. And yeah. you'll see some players, they'll be like, Oh, and they kind of like change, yeah. change your hands. And then you can create more limits by saying, okay, left hand reverse. And they'll be going, okay, I know it's left hand. Oh, reverse. And just, mm -hmm. just plenty of things like that. You can, you can give limitations like left hand off the glass only or left hand, no glass, whatever limitations you can come up with, uh, the, it will make them uncomfortable in practice in situations when they go just, Three, three on O or five on O, because oh. usually what I what I look at is if you see players facial expressions and I and I posted I want to say like one hour ago uh, a video about it. It also demonstrated some something similar. Uh, okay. Whenever you watch players doing three on O, you look at their faces. They're like this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But then whenever you see a game, they're like. So what I'm trying to do is okay. How can how can I make the practice finishes that they do, their facial expressions look a little a little bit more a little bit closer to what they'll have what they'll experience in the game. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'll be pushing them like with a pad or hitting them like crazy, but it's just mm, making them put more effort into the shot. And also another, I know I'm talking a lot. <laughs> uh, another idea that I had was what, during my recent visit in States uh, before all the pan pandemic, uh, I was watching uh, one, of, one of the games uh, on the pro level. And so I watched their pregame workouts and all the finishes were they would be doing like jelly, all the nice, all the nice things that are looking good. But then when the game started, uh, the opposite team had, uh, I want to say, seven foot five big man in the paint, or something like that, and all the finishes were just like the guys yeah. were afraid. There were a couple of people who just dunked on the guy, or 
just caught him sleep, uh, sleeping a little bit. But the majority of the other ones, especially guards, they were a little bit confused. And so if I'm the coach and I'm, I'm seeing that, I'm thinking, okay, how am I – how can I make my practice finishes more complicated where players need to put as much effort when they have no defender as they do it when they play against seven, four guy. Gotcha. And then as far as making it more complicated, getting the facial expressions to shift more towards uh, it being game, like, is that mainly a function of, intensity and like going harder in, in the practice or are you t kind of mixing in the the differing like signals and like making it uncomfortable mentally too so they have to think about mm -hmm. it more kind of a combination of both i would say i would say the second one uh i would go with with the visual reads and visual reads will be the later i can give the read to a player the harder it is for him to finish for example yeah. if he can see the read well let's say he's doing two-step layup and let's say he gets the read when he does the first step, he has the whole second step and the jump to adjust and make a good read and finish. If he mm -hmm. sees it on the second step, he has less time. But if I'm showing him the read when he's already going up in the air, he has even less time to adjust. So I will play with that. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, I like using no glass rule when we're – in the angle where everybody's teaching you to use the glass. Yeah. Just because there's still situations where you're trying to shoot off the glass, but you know there will be a big man who can hit that that small square, and this will be yeah. a block for sure. So I'm like, okay, how can you adjust your finish? How can you adjust the arc of the finish to make sure it's not blocked? Uh, that's two. And then three, if we practice and uh, if, if the players are allowed to use the glass, I usually ask them to use anything outside of that small square just because everybody's teaching the small square. And so let's say you guarding me or you're on the help side, I blew mm -hmm. by my defender and you're on the help side. We, uh, we were coached by the same coach for 10 years. And you know that both of us are taught to use the small square and you know, I'll be taking two steps and going for mm -hmm. a layup. So you're like, <laughs> okay, he'll be he'll be hitting the ball right there. He'll be aiming there. Yeah. You you're just trying to block me. But if you know that if you don't know where I'll be where I'll be aiming and how I'll shoot it, you basically don't know how to block me. And yeah. so if I can increase the arc or use a spot outside of that small square, it will be even harder for defender, especially for help side defender, to block. Gosh, gotcha. that definitely makes sense. And then in terms of finishing through contact and uh, like when you get in the paint, you deal with some contact and being able to finish through that. How do you how do you work on that with your guys? How are you have any tips as far as how to be more efficient in that situation? Mm, so number one tip and the main one will be be the one who initiates the contact. That's I mean, that's the that's the main rule. If you don't initiate the contact, then somebody will initiate it and you won't expect it. So it's either you expect in the contact and you create in it and defenders uh, defender is confused or mm. defender is initiating the contact and you're confused but you have the ball and so you most likely you'll be off balance so that would be number one thing mm, number two and I'm, i know there are probably people who uh who train just by themselves who don't have a partner or don't have a coach uh i figured out a great way to do it is uh, to use either two balls or foam roller or water jug, anything where you would be holding it, where you'll be mm. holding it and then you'll have to switch the hands just because the reason why I like it, it may look fancy, uh, but I, I don't use it as the main exercise for finishing. Mm, I prefer doing it as part of uh, warm up, just because one, it challenges your coordination yeah. Uh, it makes you struggle. <laughs> and the number two is it increases body temperature. You're basically, you just started sweating like crazy. And so this yeah. that's the good one where you do it for five minutes, you see the benefits. And then when you go to the main practice, you know that you're warmed up. And so the goal is pretty simple. Let's say, let's say I have, I have this as a foam roller. And then yeah. whenever I'm dribbling the ball, I know I call it like a, uh, I have different types of 
um, ball protection and I put the names on it just so it's easier for players to remember. The one where you, you jump, you're running with the ball like this, we call it like American football player or something like that. So imagine you dribbling the ball and get it inside the paint. You get the ball in your chest and then you have to finish. What if there's a defender coming here? If you can hold him or squeeze his hand, then you kind of protecting the ball already. And so the thing with the foam roller that I would do is get the ball to the chest, squeeze the foam roller. Just imagine like that's a hand for a defender. Take the ball with the opposite hand, control the defender here, extend and finish. Mm-hmm. And I know I know it may you may sound fancy or look fancy, and I'm still a big fan of uh, workouts with little snow equipment where there is only basketball. But if I have something, uh, I love to do that one uh, because one, if you do all things with only one basketball, sometimes the guys and especially the pros, the ones who have been playing professionally for 10, 15 years, six hours a day, they kind of like get tired and they get bored. And whenever you yeah. come up with something like that, with something fresh, they're like, oh, okay, something new, let's try it. And so you see enthusiasm on their faces and if you def- if you do that for five minutes, I'm sure you can benefit through the rest of your practice just because you'll see the smile on their face. And to me, seeing the smile on the player's face, it's more important than a lot of things just because I know they are enjoying it. And I know that, okay, if they're smiling, if, if they're looking like – if they get challenged and they're accepting that challenge, I know they'll have a higher energy rather than if they just – going like this and they just bored they just going through the motions absolutely absolutely and then it looks like we got a couple questions in the comments so i'll bring okay. one of them up right now uh let's see matthew asked oh, most I, time to use I was inside the chat and so i didn't even see it you good can you see the? can you see it on there it says mm-hmm. um most what's the most optimal time to use inside hand finishes one second. I don't see. Oh, I see it. Uh huh. Hmm. That's a good question. I want to say if you go reverse, if you go for reverse layups, that's number one thing that I when I would prefer uh, the inside hand finishes, just because you have a rim as protector, a net as protector. And then yeah. usually all the all the players are taught to finish like this. And so if I'm the one who's trying to block you, I'm usually I'll, I'll be aiming for the outside hand. And that's a great way where you can finish with the inside. Plus it will be harder to block just because the hand is too much too close to the net and to the basket. Uh, that would be number one thing. And uh, hmm, that's a good one. I want to I want to say it's hard to. To me, basketball is not the game of absolutes. You cannot give a rule like you can do it here, but you can't. You cannot do it there. What I yeah. would say, if you can study your film, and you can pause at the moment when you go for a finish, and you're like, okay, imagine what I can do here, what I can't do here, what finish will be the best one, how can I benefit from it, and what would be the one that I wouldn't use at all for sure, and you having the answers to all that will help you to to choose what you do. Got you, love it. And then uh, Maddie, Maddie had another question, so I'll bring that one up. The differences between a runner and a floater. He says, is a runner like Nash, a floater like Tony Parker? So in, in your opinion, or uh, I guess not really opinion, but what is the difference between a runner and a floater? That's a funny one because I will, uh, I've been doing the Instagram lives for the whole April and May. And that's one mm-hmm. of the questions that I would have. I would ask, how would you teach the floater? More of a push or more of a follow through? And to me, yeah, a floater is just normal floater where you either fully extend the arm or you just kind of like do more of a push. While the runner is you shooting still off one leg where you're just shooting your normal jump shot just like, like Steve, Steve Nash did. Got you. Got you. And then let's see. we got a ton of, ton of questions from... from- from Matthew. Yeah, Matt, Matt, Matt is a regular. He asked a bunch of really good questions. So That's good. We'll uh we'll make sure to get through them. Let's see. Um I see one. Do you push your wrist when shooting a floater? 
Yeah, let's bring that one up. Okay, so I mean that's individual. That that's based on the player, um, because through my experience that I had, some players will want it to be full elbow extension with the with the follow through, just like a normal jump shot, while others will want it to be more more of a push. And so I would say try to find the one that that works for you the best, and just work on it. Just if we're talking about myself. I can say that whenever I need to make a quick one where I see the defense coming, it will be more of a push. Yeah. Uh, and whenever I know that I'll have a little bit more time, I will get a full follow through where I'll make sure I'll, I'll increase the arc even, even higher. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I, I was never able to get like the, like the push one down. I, I would always have to follow through if I ever try to float her. So yeah, definitely, um, definitely super individual there. And in terms of tips for undersized guards or undersized players in general, um, what would you recommend? Or do you have any any tips, any specific things to work on as far as being more effective in the paint when you get to that position to be able to finish? Mm, I would say number one, uh, master finishes over the size. And so if we're talking about the finishes over the size, it will be uh, using different spots in the glass and just get become a master of it because you understand that you're the shortest guy in court and when you get in a paint you're playing against somebody who's maybe one foot taller than you and longer than you and you have to compromise and you have to find a way how to make you and the other guy the taller guy how to make y'all two even and so in this case if you can if you can use more high arc floaters or high arc finishes or weird spots on the glass, it'll definitely give you an advantage. Got you, got you. And then another question from Matthew. Let's see. Uh, what are what are some physical qualities that all great finishers need to have? A strong core. So, mm -hmm. uh, like physical qualities that stand out in, in like those finishers that are are, are most effective. Mm -hmm. I would say strong core number one, especially in overhead positions, and we'll, we'll be talking about all three planes of motion, uh, frontal, sagittal, and transverse. So mastering those three. Also, what will help is if you would work more on shoulder mobility, just so you can get more angles for the shot. And these the, these would be the two ones that, that I would recommend. Okay, gotcha. And then in terms of those three planes, can you like just briefly? I know, um, get kind of in, in detail there, but just um, just briefly explain like what the three different planes are, so anyone watching could kind of understand. So, um, sagittal, the one when when the body's moving front and back, basically, frontal yep. moving left and right, and transverse plane plane of motion where where the upper body is rotating. And so I would say here. Uh, I love focusing more on transverse plane of motion just because if we study all the finishes that basketball players do, majority of them, if we're talking about finishes in traffic, it's something where the body's rotating at least a little bit, either mm -hmm. by themselves or when they create in the contact and they have to rotate after. And so I would focus, if I would have to choose only one plane of motion, it would be transverse. Got it, got it. And then if we're looking at just three, three to five finishes that you feel are like most effective that like should be in every player's arsenal, um, what are those like kind of top three or five finishes that that you're focusing on getting in the bag first? It's a tough question, but if you if you had to narrow it down, what would it, what would they be? Number one will be uh, weak hand. Let's say if I'm right-handed. And we're talking about right-handed player is going to be number one, uh, left foot, left foot, left hand reverse. Just okay. because there's plenty of situations where players driving through the baseline and he's like looking for partners, and the defenders are also playing like that. Yeah. And so most of the guys they're not comfortable with just go right away and finishing it. And mm -hmm. so you, if you can master that one, one it'll get you more points, and two it'll make the defenders commit to you, just so you can create more more passing and more scoring opportunities for your teammates. That will be number one. Uh, number two will be left foot, left foot, right hand floater of the first step. And I'm saying of the first step just because most players are used to finish off two steps. 
And yeah. like I gave an example earlier, if me and you are playing uh, defense on each other and we've been taught by the same coach, you probably know how I'll be going to finish of the two steps, but you're not expecting me to finish all the first step. So this would be number two. And number three, I want to say it will be just any type of step through, just whenever you can get a jump stop and step through. I know in states they would probably call it a travel, at least the coaches, uh, when you take the pivot foot off. Yeah. And even, even the old school coaches in Europe, that would also call it travel. But, I mean, according to FIBA rules, that's clean. Gotcha. Any type of step through situation, uh, I would definitely add it, and you have to be smart here. Where uh, at the level where you where you playing, if you know that the referees will be calling a travel if you step through and take out the pivot foot, you won't be you won't be smart enough. Or you'll be like, no, no, that's not a travel. That's not a travel. Let's play through it. You have yeah. to adjust to the situation that you have. And so, if you're let's say you're playing in a high school level. And the rest will be calling step through with taking the pivot foot off as travel, jump off two feet. Mm -hmm. If you go to college and let's say you play division one level and you can step through and take the pivot foot off, nobody's calling travel, use it. If you go play professionally, you see in your league, uh, they don't call travel, but let's say in Russian league, you take the pivot foot off and they'll call it travel. Be smart and use it in your league games jump off two feet in, in VTB league games. And so you, you always have to be able to adjust to the situation and easier it is for you to adjust. It's just, it's just gonna be much easier for you to reach your goals. And I think there is a, there's a quote is something, um, I don't remember exactly, but it's something the easier it is for you to adjust to situations, the more, the more you can achieve. And I mean, that, that's how it is. Exactly. No, I to totally agree with you there. And then looking across the NBA and really, I mean, across any professional leagues, um, who would you say are some players to, uh, for, for younger players to look at in terms of learning more about like finishing and, and a good example to look at? I would say my favorite one is Steve Nash. Just because gotcha. one, he's not the one who has crazy vertical. Yeah. And at the same time, I can say that he's athletic because He's not athletic in vertical plane of motion, but he's athletic. He can change directions fast. He can control his body. And he's able to finish off different types of footwork with different hands and creating the contact of different spots of the glass. He would be number one that I would study. Number two, I would say if we're talking about floater, I would go with Tony Parker. Just because he's able to shoot the floaters off two feet and especially yeah. off the spin move. So what I will study here is uh, try and see what he does right after the spin, how he finds the balance. Does he does he find the room with his eyes or he does something else? Just try to look for the small details. So he will be number two. And I'm just trying, I'm just trying to say somebody, uh, not the players that everybody would mention, just like, of course, I can say yeah. Kyrie and Steph. That's that's obvious. But yeah, I'm trying to think of the other ones. Mm. Yeah, I know. I'll say Aaron Jackson, and probably mm. old listeners or very few of the listeners know who's there, who Aaron Jackson is. Uh, he's one of the players that I worked with, and I was with him in China for two and a half seasons. Uh, he played a little bit with the Rockets. He's six four, uh, combo guard, and so. Uh, while we were in China, his second year in China, he used left hand just just greatly. His first year in China, uh, I think he made only eight uh, left hand layups or ten left hand layups in during forty games. And then his second season, I believe he made forty five or something like that. So it was at least one one left hand layup every game. And he's right hand dominant. And at that point, he was thirty two, thirty two or thirty three. So. That's that's a great progress for for that age, uh, and I even have a video on him. You can just type either Aaron Jackson left hand development on YouTube, or you can go to my Instagram to Instagram TV, and that will be one of the first videos. Uh, we worked a lot on on the left hand finishes, and I just saw how 
how greatly he progressed through through our years together. And uh, I want to say here, you asked uh, about intensity, and you were you you asked if working on the finishing, if it would be only about intensity to going harder and harder. The funny thing during some of our workouts with Aaron, the goal will be not to sweat. <laughs> so we come to the gym, we have uh, 20 minutes before team practice or something. I'm like, okay, you just walk, try, try not to sweat at all. And it would just be, I know it would sound funny from the coach who was saying, okay, try not to sweat, but that's how it is because I understood that he's 32, 33. And if he's sweating for another 20 minutes, it's just, it just putting too much load on his body. You know, he's playing 30 plus minutes. Uh, while my goal was to challenge not his physical abilities, but his more his nervous system, where he's used to certain patterns on finishing, I wanted to break those habits and create a new ones where he'll have more habits and whenever he gets into pain, he can do different types of stuff. Because in a game, in practice, you can think. In game, it's mostly based on instincts. So if you can improve those instincts through practice and improve your nervous system response through practice, then in game, it will be just easier for you. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. And then in terms of looking at how you balance those higher intensity training sessions with lower intensity training sessions, what, what would be like your general approach? Obviously it's a very context dependent mm -hmm. question and on the athlete, their age, the time of the season, but in general, like how are you going about, uh, kind of walking that fine line between pushing yourself but not pushing yourself too hard to where you overtrain and it's kind of detrimental. So if we talk in general, uh, the main thing that I try to do is to get the feedback from player before we even start working. Yeah. And so let's say we meet 15 minutes before the workout and I already have the whole workout planned. Uh, I'll be asking him how he feeling, if there's anything that bothers him, what, what his mood is, just to understand at what mental state he is. Is he ready to go 100% or he's at a point where I need to push him a little bit more? Or maybe he's at a point where I should just sit back and kind of like let him choose the pace and me go with it. It does mean that I'll be like, okay, okay, it's not on you. I don't want, I'm trying to please you. It's not at that point, but it's me giving him uh tasks different tasks to do and just seeing how he responds if yeah. i see that to something if i see that a player responds harder uh to something more intense i'll be thinking okay how i can uh i how can i go down uh with intensity just to make sure we still are efficient in the time that we have together and it's usually yeah i i think the best advice here will be just to get as much feedback from the player as you can. At the same time, you have to find that fine line in between getting the feedback and not being annoyed and asking like, how are you doing? Is your knee okay? Is your hip okay? Are you doing well? Did you, what did you eat for breakfast? Just where the, the player will be yeah. like, are you my mom <laughs> or grandma or what? what, what? <laughs> Too many yeah, questions. That's interesting because definitely, I mean, in terms of what I do on the nutrition front, it's it's tough to strike that balance between asking too many questions to where you're bothering them and like getting the feedback you need to, to make adjustments and to make sure everything's going right. So definitely with you on that one. Um, and then another question we got from the comments was, let's see, do you think a high school guard should master finishing outside their frame with like extension layups? Or is that too advanced and should be practiced at the college level? So I think that's that's a general question just because there are different type of high school guards and same thing, different yeah. types of college and pro level players. Uh, I would say find one or two options in the paint that you know will work against any defender and on any level and just master them first. Because just like Bruce Lee said, I'm not afraid of the person who practices a thousand kicks one time. I'm afraid of the one who practices one kick a thousand times. Yeah. Same thing here. Imagine, um, imagine if you can develop one tool on offense, let's say one move in the paint or one finish in the paint that nobody can stop. Would it, would it be better to have this rather than be average at 10 other ones? 
I would go with the first one. And so yeah. if you can master the one, the first one, and then you feel, okay, now I can add something else, then just add something else to it. But I will go mm, one or two finishes that you get comfortable with in the paint against, against any competition and focus on them first. Gotcha. And on that same note, I'm curious to, to know like from your perspective, um, like I know you said I'd rather you practice or, or be like a master one or two moves, get like really, really good at them. Um, how much time would you spend like mastering like your, your superpowers, so to speak, versus like trying to expand your game and like add new things to your arsenal? Mm, that's, it depends on the player and on, home, on how much time we have. But if we're talking about the weekend development, it would usually be, uh, I want to say 100 shots or 120 shots by the end of the practice. And I usually love counting the shots and the number of makes you'll have just, just because if you can only go by 50 makes and let's say you take notes and after one week you have 50 makes, 50 makes, 50 makes, 50 makes. So seven days with 50 makes. One thing that you know is, okay, I made 50 makes every day. And that's it. You can't see what your percentage was, uh, how, how, how much better you got during the, during this time. But if you can shoot every day, let's say a hundred layups, different ones, and you write down your percentage, let's say today I'm 38 from 100 tomorrow. I'm 39 a week after I'm 42. It'll just give you a better perspective where you see how you progress. So this that's what more important to me because and I, I know that it comes from uh, my background when I was playing and I was I was not a good shooter. Shooting was my main weakness. And usually when uh, when you talk to coach, he usually says, OK, just shoot more. And I would shoot 500 shots, 1000 shots. I remember my first time, my first time I had that gun, the shooting machine, and I shot I want to say 1600s, and I was at that place. It was in South Carolina. Uh, yeah. I was at that place. It was Greenville, South Carolina, and I was there for three days. My second day, I come there, and my wrist just hurt. It just hurt. And now I, I was so happy the night before. I'm like, oh man, I shot 1600s jump shots. Yeah. And the next day, I'm like, I could barely bend it. And so at that point, I realized it's it's quality over quantity. And so the same thing here, if you just make 50 every day, and you put in your notes. OK, great. But if you can shoot 100 and put the percentages in there, to me, that will be wiser. Yeah. Gotcha. And then uh, we got a couple questions, both yep. from the Instagram questions box and, and the comments asking about um, like how many days a week should I train? How do I make my workouts more efficient and, and kind of on that subject of like how how much time should I be spending in the gym? So how would you go about making your, your training sessions for your players like more efficient so they're getting more quality out of it versus um, just focusing on the quantity? I know we mentioned percentages and stuff like mm -hmm. that, but is there anything else you implement to to get the most out of your time in the gym without like spending crazy amounts of time to the point where it's just not really beneficial anymore? Hmm. I would say do more short sessions. So instead of coming to the gym and staying there for three hours, if you can go twice and go one and a half hour and one and a half hour, that would be more beneficial. Uh, that's number one thing. Number two, you have to understand that not all the work has to be high intensity. Yeah. Just like I mentioned when, when we worked with Aaron and we had that no sweat, uh, quick workouts. I mean, <laughs> no sweat workouts already sound funny, but that's how it is. You have to understand mm, when, you can increase the intensity and when vice versa, when you can, when you have to drop it down. And so how to understand it, just learn how to feel your body. It took me, it took me too many years to figure out yeah. <laughs> how, to, how to listen to my body. And I still, I still think that uh, I'm not a master of it yet, but at least, at least I'm better already. <laughs> I'm better already. And so, I would recommend just listening to the body and uh, I would rather working hard every day is good, but working smart will be more beneficial. And mm -hmm. if you wake up and if you feel that 
if you feel that you're not that enthusiastic to go to the gym today, not because you're lazy, but because just your body feels like you're about to pass out, just take one day yeah. off. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting one, like the whole motivation to train. Um, I don't think people realize how good of a metric that is to to kind of gauge whether or not you're ready for for a training session that day. Because I mean, like you said, most of the time in those situations, you're not even you're not even lazy. Like you really don't have an issue like, getting to the gym. It's just like your yeah, your body feels like it's about to fall apart, and it's like, well, I saw this motivational video on Instagram or on YouTube, so I got to get up and just grind it out. Yep, the signs, the signs here, uh, the signs that I had were number one, I wake up and I'm feeling that, oh man, I know that I have to go to the gym, but I don't really, I'm like, okay, well, I'll go. That's sign number one. Sign number two is uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a sweet tooth, but I can, eat, I eat chocolate sometimes. And whenever I'm at the point where I'm ready to kill the whole plate, I know, yeah. okay, probably today will be very light or today I'll go hard and tomorrow will be off. Yeah. Got you. These, these, yeah, these two are the main ones. Got you. And then um, kind of building off of that, it, is there a time and a place where you just kind of got to suck it up? Like when you wake up and you're just like, yeah, like I don't really feel like training, but like I'm going to push through it today yeah for sure every i mean every now and then there's nothing wrong with that but to me it's more important that you realize if that's because uh, because you're lazy or if that's because your body is not letting you to go to get up and go and train yeah absolutely yeah. Uh, to me finding out which one of those two that's that's an art if you can figure oh, that yeah. out you'll be a master of it because i remember when i was getting ready to play in college and I'll plan all the workouts. I still have those notes somewhere in my laptop. And it will be like three workouts a day, sometimes yeah. before. And I'm like, I'm looking at it now. I'm like, okay, it makes sense why at 26, I started to have those small nagging injuries every, yeah. every two months or so when I would be going harder and harder and harder and something, boom out two weeks and then you get back to normal another two weeks i figured out that's because i was not able to um, to plan the load well yeah gotcha and then um as well like now that things are starting to open back up a little bit gyms are, are um, opening up players are getting back in the gym how are you progressing your players like back into basketball shape without going too hard too quickly? So I know that's a problem a lot of hoopers are going to run into because everyone's super excited to like get in the gym. They want to be in the gym like all day, every day, going super hard, um, running fives for four hours straight if they can. And um, that might just be a recipe for, for injury and not a good look. So how are you progressing your players or encouraging your players to progress from quarantine being on the couch maybe some driveway ball handling drills back into um playing full on five on five so most of the pro guys that i worked with they did something during the quarantine they at least ran and if i work with a group of let's say four or five players and i know that they have been doing something uh, they have been doing something i'll try to increase the intensity gradually without just going super intense right at the first day but if I would give an advice to younger ones who are now getting back to their normal normal schedule, number one thing that I would focus more is landing and just, just learning how to land, learning how to land on two feet, on one foot. And the same thing, you can use a simple progression when you go sagittal plane, frontal plane, transverse plane of motion, and you go off on two feet, on one foot there, and just that's already going to be – a nice little workout yeah because because before you know how to how to speed it up you got to know how to put the brakes yeah for sure and then as we're getting close to the hour mark here as we start to wrap it up a little bit i'm, I'm curious <laughs> from your perspective what are some things that you're kind of re looking into now um like researching now that are kind of piquing your interest like any any new um science you've been looking at that um that has you fascinated uh, I want to say now I'm trying to look more 
into a psychological part where I would I, I would understand better how I can build relationships with the players, how I I'm able to build the trust uh, faster and better with them, just to make sure they understand it's I'm trying I'm there for them, and I'm trying to help them get to their goals. Gotcha. Okay. And then I'll, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go sorry, ahead. it lied for a little bit. Right. Excellent. Cut you off. I would say that there are plenty of coaches who are very knowledgeable, but yeah. they may not know how they may not know well how to communicate with the players. And so when when you don't have a trust in uh, yes, they had a presentation for the Federation of Basketball of Chile. And so that's the same thing that we talked about. I said that you can be the smartest coach in the world, but if you don't have trust, if you're if your player don't trust you. He won't listen to you. But at the same time, if you're the worst coach in the world, if you don't understand nothing, yeah. but the player says, man, he's he's my guy. Yeah. He he said, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is why uh, I want to say you have to learn first how to create that communication and how to build that relationship relationships first and then you can go and teach and correct something awesome awesome and then just as as we're wrapping up just one more question would be mm -hmm. if you yep. have one piece of advice to um if you if you had to give one piece of advice to a younger athlete coming up whether it be high school college or a younger pro guy just getting started what would it be it could be on the court it could be off the court you could take this wherever you want um but what would, what would your number one piece of advice be if if somebody who is listening to it knows me, they'll know that I'm I'm the goal guy, the one who always talks about the goals, goals, goals. I, I would say just find a goal, find your goal where you where you see yourself in one two years, and just create. Uh, go backwards. Imagine yourself in two years where you will be, and think what you need to do within those two years to make sure you get there, and just just build a plan, because without a goal. You're just, you don't understand what you have accomplished. You don't understand. It's harder for you to estimate what progress you made. And sometimes yeah. where your motivation level can go down and you're just, you think you're not working hard enough. Maybe yeah. if you have this plan and you see, you look through it, you're like, oh man, I've been, I've done that much. I didn't know that, man. It's time for me to, to keep pushing it more. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Now metrics are super important. Now, like you said, it can really help with the whole motivation thing. Cause a lot of times it can feel like you're, doing, you're working super hard. You're putting all these hours in the gym, but like you're not where you want to be yet. And it feels like you're not doing yeah. enough. Exactly. One hundred percent agree with you there. And then where can everyone keep up with what you have going on with your content, with um, anything else you have going on? Where can people uh, follow you uh, at? Yeah, let me, I see. I see one more question from Matthew. Let me just go through it. Uh, it's from, about Paul, about Paul Fabris. Yeah. Um, Paul Fabris said, if we are right hand dominant, we should practice right hand floater majority of time compared to your left hand floater. He said to make the right hand floater your superpower, you agree? Yeah, I would agree with that. And it's again, it's individual. And the reason why I wanted to pick that one because uh, in our first off season with Aaron, we spent a lot of time working on left hand floater but then whenever we started the the season the second season together in china i would see that he uses left hand a lot more but he never used the floater and so i was thinking okay he's a million dollar athlete uh and i'm the one who's helping him and so this is um that's really that's that's precious and so i cannot mm, i cannot waste any time that we have together and so yeah. I just ask, him, what do you think if we keep working on that left hand floater? Do you see yourself using it in a game? And he's saying, you know, I'm I don't think so. Maybe. But I didn't see that in his face when he would be like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, if he would say that, I'll be like, OK, we keep working on it. But when he was kind of like not sure, yes or no. I'm thinking, okay, what if we spend this time doing something else? And just asking the Matthews question, yeah, I would agree with Paul that in order, if we're talking about floaters, I would first uh, focus on the dominant hand. And then whenever you feel that, yeah, you'll start shooting the offhand floaters, your weaker hand floaters too, 
you can work on it. But first, try to, just like I mentioned earlier, uh, try to focus on, on the main finishes that you feel that you'll be using in the games. Because if we take, let's say you need 500, 500 makes on floaters uh, in order to use them in games, yeah. and you need 100 makes on left-hand scoops to start using them in the games, I would choose the left hand scoops just because you have to you you have to do five times less in order to use it in the game and to add it to what you can do rather mm -hmm. than floater. And the other four hundred makes I could, I would use it for something else. So again, it comes down to finding the ways how you can be as efficient as possible without spending a lot of energy. Love it, love it. Now I appreciate you taking the time to come on here and yeah. answer all these questions. I know I learned a ton, and I always say. Like whenever I learn learn a ton in an episode, it's always it's always a good one. I know everyone else Thanks, is, so I appreciate Thank your you. time. Asking the last question of yours when when you said how people can keep up, keep up with me, uh, the best one I would say uh, Instagram. It's bossy pro. Yeah, this one. And so I usually post there. I try to post there maybe four or five times per week. Whenever I'm not very busy with the workouts. But it's just to me, Instagram is a way where you can see different ideas from the other people and see how you can apply them to what you do. And also just just my principle is don't hesitate to ask if you doubt in some, if you doubt something in the same way. If I, um, I, I saw you had Mike G on a, on a podcast recently. And so I would annoy him sometimes, too. I'll be like, hey, Mike, I like this one. Would you do that for big toe activation? And he'd be like this and this and this and this. And I'm not shy. Uh, I'm not shying away from asking and trying not trying to look stupid because at the end of the day, he's posting it just for people to learn and maybe get inspired by it. Just like yeah. you probably heard that from him. From him, greatness breeds greatness. That's mm -hmm. that's how it is. And so if you see something on Instagram that I posted and you think that you would use it, but you're not exactly sure how, just don't hesitate to message me. I'll try to get back to you. Love it, love it. Yeah, same here on the nutrition front. If you have any questions for me, you know my DMs are wide open. So um, yeah, I appreciate you coming on the show. And if you guys are new around here, coming from Bossy's page, uh, feel free to subscribe if you want some free nutrition content posted on here three times a week, yeah, post on IG, uh, three times a day. So. Tons of free content coming your guys' way. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. Let me know if you have any other questions. Make sure to follow Bossy on Instagram. You see it down below. It should be right there. And uh, <laughs> I will see you guys on the next show. Thank you, Tommy.